The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Enlighten our minds, we pray, O God, by the Spirit who proceeds from you, that as your Son has promised, we may be led into all truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to another podcast on an epistle for Proper 23B. And the gospel for this Sunday is from Mark 10, 17 to 22. Um, this is a lesson from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 19, which is new to our lectionary. This was not found in the old lectionary. And I think it's uh, interesting. We had Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, but we decided to change it because we thought 1 to 6 did not necessarily have enough in order to preach on it. Um, I think I've talked to you about Hebrews before. I highly recommend this book by Van Oya called The Structure and Message of the Epistle to the Hebrews. And of course, there is the great Kleining commentary now that we use. And um, I will be referring to his translation because he really does sparkle here. Um, he describes this section, and he has the section from 7 to 19, and that would be a consideration. Really, what the, the difference is, is verses 7 to 11 is the citation from the, uh, the, <clears throat> the Old Testament. And, you know, you could begin by that. He's going to make a reference to it uh, throughout this thing. But you know that, that this is the section where the author of the Hebrews is comparing the situation in his congregation to the Israelites and, and to, the, to the hardening of the hearts that happened to them while they were in the wilderness. And like you see with Paul, do not be like them. Okay? You, you, th this is an example for us not to go into the, the situation that we are facing with this sort of persecution and malaise that was given to the Israelites also in their malaise while they're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. We do not want to respond in the way in which they responded. Um, I'm also very dependent before Kleinig on Helmut Kester, not Helmut Kester, Craig Kester, who um, in his commentary on Hebrews talks about the fact that the Hebrews are in this malaise, the, the, the congregation that he's writing. And, and it's, it's a malaise because they have, they're, they're sort of before a, a serious persecution and they're, they're thinking about apostatizing, or at least going back to the Jewish way. I think that one of the wonderful examples here that, that helps illustrate this, Paul fought the Judaizers who were Pharisees, and, and they were trying to get people to go back to a kind of Pharisaical type of Christianity. Whereas in Hebrews, it's not Pharisees, it's probably the chief priests, the Sadducees, the priestly you know, uh, cult, and, and they're trying to persuade the audience that is receiving the, the epistle to the Hebrews to kind of go back to the temple. So with this in mind, let's take a look at the text, okay? Um, you can see here that the word unbelief is, is right here in the first verse, you know? And, and it, it's, a, again, with these imperatives, I have these in blue. See, brothers, um, there is not any of you with an evil heart of unbelief, you know. Now, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a strong word. I mean, we're, we're talking here about apostasy, apostasy. And we're talking here about people who are, are, are coming, you know, away from the living God, you know, turning away from them. Now, <laughs> you know, are we in this situation? I think so. I think we definitely have people who are seeking to move away from the living God. And, and it's important for us to recognize this in our day and age, that, that the, the, the apostasy by sheer malaise, just being tired of fighting the battles, being tired of, 
of trying to be a Christian in a world that is hostile to you is so difficult. And you can see what, what he does, but encourage one another, encourage one another, parakaleo, you know, um, and to do it, do it daily. The, the, this, is, this is the nature of the church. This is why we gather together. This is why we have the liturgy, so that we can come together. That's Pauline language, but we can come together we can hear the word of God. We can receive the gifts of the presence. And uh, it's important for us to recognize that. Now, he says, you know, until which time it is called today. Now, that, that comes from that passage, you know, where uh, in, in verse 7 of this chapter, so as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. You can see that he's echoing back to that notion of today. Today, now, in this situation, and this is what the Israelites were called to do, and this is now what this congregation is called to do. So that none of you, and here's the hardening of the hearts, so that none of you may um, have your hearts hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, I think these are paralleled here. Unbelief comes from the deceitfulness of sin. And what happens to people who are in this malaise, who are moving towards hypocrisy, I mean hypocrisy, apostasy, the, the movement involves them in, you know, being brought into sinful behavior. And again, the parallel of the golden calf, you know, the, 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 the wandering in the wilderness of the, the, the Israelites and their malaise of being, I mean, I, I, I do sympathize with them. Forty years of being in the desert, that's a long, long time. But look at the, the language here. Watch out, you know, um, encourage one another. You know, every day, as long as it's called today, harking back. You know, so that your, your heart is not hardened. And the hardening of the heart, and again, unbelief, are really on the same level there. Okay, the, the next passage, I think, is one that really does, um, whoops, here we go, um, bring us into some gospel here. Partakers, let us become partakers of Christ. Um, fellow sharers in Christ. Th this, of course, is baptismal language. This is a, a, a calling them back to their baptism. And when, when he says, we, we need to remain, continue in being this partakers of Christ. And here's, here's the language of communion, sharing. And communion, I mean communion with the flesh of Jesus. Because Christ is, we can't be party to sin. And you can see the contrast right here, you know. Um, and he says, for we remain partakers of Christ if only we hold on to the foundation as something firm until the end. There's the hypostasios, Okay. Until firm, until the end. Now, it, the, the, you can see that he's aware of the malaise. He, he can see them slipping. He can see them slipping. And uh, the language here is, is so important to, to see here. Katas komen. That, that is such a sort of jumps out at you. This is that inner assurance, that ground of hope that we have because of our baptism. And that is what allows us to, to deal with the malaise and even the coming persecution. And here he goes back and cites, cites the, the Old Testament again. And, and you can see today, there it is, if you hear his voice, and we do in the liturgy, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And that, of course, is the rebellion in the desert. Don't be like them. It's, this is, 
this is a liturgical refrain that goes through these chapters, you know, and it's, it's sort of a negative one, but I think you can see how, how it can be very, very powerful in that way. Then he continues here, verse 16, with the, the, the language of hearing. For who became bitter when they heard? But all those who went out of Egypt with Moses, these are all questions, notice this. Question, 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 question. Look at all those questions. Um, verse 17, and with whom was he disgusted for 40 years? That's the declining translation, I like that. Disgusted for 40 years. Um, and he, he asked this question, was it not those who sinned? Here's the language of sin again, okay? The deceitfulness of sin. Here he's, he's marking those in the wilderness. And, and it's, it's amazing, this is a horrible thing, whose corpses fell in the desert. And then he asked, and to whom did he swear that they shall not enter the rest? There's the... There's that refrain, the rest, and there's the promised land. I think it, it refers certainly to the promised land in its literal thing, and obviously the rest of heaven, but I think there's always in between the rest that comes at the Eucharistic table. You know, now, now you can see here, he starts with a tinnis, but then to whom, to whom? You know, this is, this is a refrain. This is pounding. This is rhetoric. And he's, again, harking back to the malaise of the Israelites, citing this today here first. And then look at how he ends this here. This is so important. Um, oh, wait a minute. Let me finish this. Verse 18. To whom... Uh, did he swear that they would not enter the place of rest if not those who were faithless? Now there's the language of faithless that takes us back to the beginning here. I didn't mean to erase all that, but that's okay. Um, well, where are we? The faithless here, the faithless. Now you can see the blepate and the faithless. And, and as we come down here, we have the faithless again, and the blepoma. So what a wonderful frame. And, and he ends in 19 by saying, um, when they see, when then, excuse me, and then we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. We see. This is what we recognize. And you, you can see above here that he says, look, brothers, about their unbelief. And then he says, yes, we do see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. You know, and sin. One of the things you might want to think about is the relationship between unbelief and sin. And, and I, I love this language of the malaise. I think that's what we're in. We are in the malaise. And that malaise is continually plaguing us because we just do not know what it is that is happening around us in this, in this culture. The culture is just banging on us and we don't know how to respond. Now, I want to compare this now to the gospel lesson from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22, which is, of course, the situation with the rich young man. Think about the unfaithfulness here that he is calling them to reject, the sinfulness, and this, this story of the rich young man who is not willing to give up, you know, you know his, his riches and follow Jesus. And, and you can see that, again, we have that refrain that we had a couple of weeks ago, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, that, that's in verse 30, 
Um, <clears throat> but, but I think you can go forward and see that as being a very important part of one of the refrains that goes through the, the entire part of the Markin, you know, chapters 9 and 10, and really is part of this season of Pentecost, that, that we are in the harvest, that the malaise is, is all around us, and we, and we really need to recognize how important it is for us to, to see ourselves, not as the first, not, not kind of supping deeply at the cultural, cultural cup, and, and recognizing that being last means that, that it is going to be hard for us, that, that we are, in a sense, in the desert, but that in the midst of the desert, we have the encouragement of one another, we have the, all the gifts we need, we have the joy of the Eucharist, we have the joy of our fellowship together, we even have the joy, and I know this sounds crazy, but the, of the sufferings that we experience in the midst of this persecution. Sometimes there is no greater joy than, than recognizing one's commitment to Christ and, and being faithful to our confession when all around us it looks as if things are going south. We, we could just simply kind of give in to this malaise and just give in to the, to the culture that's around us and say, okay, I can't fight it. Or we can just simply continue to meet together hear the word of God, be encouraged with one another, and, and to, to receive the gift of the body and blood of Christ that nurtures us along the way. And so, as we continue in this Pentecost season in the reading of Mark's gospel, and what we're going to see now is a series of lessons from Hebrews. We've already had one, Hebrews 2. Now we're going to be going next week to Hebrews 4. And then in, in a few more weeks in Hebrews 9 and 10. And the example of the situation in Hebrews, especially that malaise, is so pertinent to the world in which we live in today.